بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم مائی ٹاپک آف مائی ٹوڈے از لیکچر از کرونک انٹسٹائنل ابسٹرکشن اینڈ اے ڈائنامک ابسٹرکشن دا لرننگ آبجیکٹو آف دس لیکچر از دیٹ ایٹ دا اینڈ آف دس لیکچر آل دا اسٹوڈنٹ شوڈ بی ایبل ٹو ڈیفائن وٹ از کرونک انٹسٹائنل ابسٹرکشن اینڈ اے ڈائنامک ابسٹرکشن how to investigate them and what is the treatment treatment of these conditions in relation to the intestinal obstruction we use three terms you should all know about that we have discussed previously acute intestinal obstruction then intestinal obstruction may be sub acute and intestinal obstruction may be chronic so we are going to discuss today chronic intestinal obstruction now the symptoms of chronic intestinal obstruction may arise from two sources that is number one what is the cause of that chronic intestinal obstruction and then the symptoms they depend upon the subsequent obstruction which develops so symptoms due to causes and then symptoms due to obstruction which subsequently do develops so chronic intestinal obstruction basically if we if we just think about it is basically showing it is a duration dependent timing of the obstruction and the symptomatology which occurs due to this that differs from acute intestinal obstruction so we differentiate from acute intestinal obstruction due to these two factors now if we talk about the causes of chronic intestinal obstruction these may be organic causes or they can be functional causes among the organic causes if we enumerate we can start from obstruction causes due to obstruction within the lumen one is fecal impaction it's not a common problem but rarely very uncommonly fecal impaction can lead to chronic intestinal obstruction then intrinsic intramural causes can lead to organic chronic intestinal obstruction examples are strictures due to crohn's disease strictures due to ischemia strictures due to diverticular disease and there can be malignant strictures due to carcinoma of the intestine large gut small gut then anastomotic stenosis that can also lead to chronic intestinal obstruction and now what are what are the cause extrinsic intramural causes of organic obstruction among that metastatic deposits for example ovarian carcinoma can lead to peritoneal metastasis and this can also lead to organic intestinal obstruction endometriosis this is another cause of chronic intestinal obstruction arising extrinsic intramural causes stomal stenosis very uncommonly a stoma can stenose and lead to chronic intestinal obstruction among the causes of functional chronic intestinal obstruction hirschsprung disease idiopathic megacolon then pseudo obstruction these are basically functional causes of chronic intestinal obstruction now this photograph shows a stomal stenosis here you can see the stoma which has retracted and skin has stenosed over the whole and this has led to chronic intestinal obstruction because it was a colostomy so it's a chronic large bowel obstruction now what are the the symptoms of chronic intestinal obstruction differ in their from the acute intestinal obstruction they differ in their predominance that means the symptoms with which occur in acute intestinal obstruction and symptoms with occur with chronic intestinal predominantly the, the they are different 
the predominance of symptoms that varies with chronic intestinal ulcer as compared to acute intestinal ulcer. Then the second factor of develop symptomatology is timing. Obviously, chronic obstruction is time, is long duration. Then severity, degree from so when we compare with acute intestinal obstruction, the degree as compared to with acute intestinal obstruction is less. So these are the three uh, points, predominance of symptoms, timing, duration and the severity or you can say degree where we can differentiate between chronic intestinal obstruction and acute intestinal obstruction. In functional cases, as we have told in the previous slide, the symptoms may have been present for months and years. So you can imagine the timing, long duration is another feature of chronic intestinal obstruction. Now the symptomatology of chronic intestinal, when we compare with acute intestinal obstruction, cardinal features, cardinal classical symptoms, among very prominent is usually it starts with the pain. But as when we go to the chronic intestinal obstruction, the first symptom which develops is constipation. Chronic constipation that appears first. Initially it is relative then become absolute that firstly it is only the constipation patient passes flatus so and this is this constipation is associated with abdominal distension cross abdominal distension then another important uh, presentation of chronic intestinal abdominal distension which may be sometimes very marked so again compare with the acute intestinal abdominal distension is a very marked uh, very marked uh, symptom presentation of the chronic in large bowel disease the point of greatest distension is in the cecum and this is heralded by the onset of pain so in large gut obstruction when there is a massive distension it is the cecum blind point where the maximum pressure the point where maximum pressure in trochlanic pressure develops and this is this is by the heralded case a very marked distension and why pain develops when there is a marked distension in the cecum because this is the point where maximum in trochlanic pressure develops due to blind end of the large gut and that's why here ischemia can occur and which leading to perforation so this basically heralds the onset of pain ischemia leading to peritonism and ultimately peritonitis can develop now vomiting which is an important feature in acute intestinal obstruction in large gut in chronic intestinal obstruction when we compare vomiting is a late feature and therefore dehydration is less severe which is very marked in acute intestinal obstruction. So this is how we can compare chronic intestinal obstruction and acute intestinal obstruction as far as symptomatology is concerned. Now if we examine these patients, examination is unremarkable when we compare with acute intestinal obstruction, except distension is there in acute intestinal, but it is marked in in chronic intestinal obstruction. So, abdominal tension can be profound onset of peritonism in late cases. That means late cases, what will happen because of the gross distension, large interclonic pressures, ischemic patches that can develop on the large gut, the standard large gut, especially cecum, which takes the maximum brunt of the pressure. If we do rectal examination in these patients, they may show the presence of fecal impaction or sometimes you can feel a tumor with your index finger. Now if we do investigation, what investigation they are, uh, we do in chronic intestinal obstruction? One important 
is plain abdominal x-ray pain plain abdominal radiography it confirms the presence of large bowel of distension huge distended large bowel can be seen even on plain x-ray of the abdomen all such cases should be investigated by a subsequent single contrast water soluble anema so this is another investigation water soluble contrast used for barium anema uh, for anema through that it is injected per anum so this is another investigation which can be helpful in chronic intestinal obstruction contrast enhanced ct scan ct scan it should be undertaken to exclude a functional cause contrast enhanced ct scan another investigation helpful for the diagnosis of and the underlying cause of chronic intestinal obstruction now if we come to the treatment of this uh, la uh, chronic large bowel obstruction organic disease basically requires decompression with either a laparotomy or stent organic we're talking about when there's an organic obstruction that will ultimately require a de decompression with either laparotomy or sometimes uh, endoscopic stenting that can be done but before that supportive treatment is required what is supportive treatment you can pass nasogastric tube for stomach decompression if that is distended pass a Foley's catheter because we have to measure urine output while resuscitating this patient intravenous fluids are given abdominal girth measurement and the most important part of supportive treatment is monitoring and what is monitoring monitoring of the vital sign because it is the monitoring with the vital signs and the abdominal girth measurement which will be helpful to see whether patient is improving or you, whether your resuscitation is adequate or not now organic obstruction ultimately will require surgery and what is required is decompression this decompression can be done with a laparotomy or it can be done with a stent which can be passed through the clonoscope depending upon underlying cause so this is the choice laparotomy and stent with clonoscope again this decision is depends upon the underlying cause we talked about one cause of stomal stenosis when the stoma has been formed and it leads to a retraction and stenosis of the stoma skin of this stoma that can usually be managed at the abdominal wall level with the refashioning of the stoma so in that case locally we can do refashioning of the stoma and this is the treatment of stomal stenosis Functional disease requires clono clonoscopic. Uh, we, you now, if we talk about the treatment of functional causes of intestinal obstruction, usually it's the clonoscopic decompression in the first instance and conservative management that is usually helpful in these patients. So, conservative management including along with clonoscopic decompression passing a call uh, clonoscope and decompressing the large gut if that pass, has passed through the uh, uh, part which is flaccid intestinal perforation can occur in patients with functional obstruction and need exploratory laparotomy so usually functional obstruction does not need functional disease does not need surgery but if huge dilatation has occurred leading to perforation in these patient obviously then if it, they know this is a case of fecal peritonitis and it will require exploratory laparotomy 
So here you can see a gross functional. This is there is no organic obstruction. This patient, this loop you can see is a hugely distended loop of large gut, and this is just functional distension, not no organic cause. Now, if we come to the a dynamic a dynamic obstruction, now a dynamic obstruction that means obstruction where there is no organic cause mechanical there is no mechanical obstruction it is it has it is of two types one in a dynamic obstruction we talk about the paralytic ileus and the second variety of a dynamic obstruction non mechanical obstruction is pseudo obstruction this can be a small bowel pseudo obstruction and it can be large bowel pseudo a pseudo obstruction now we talk about what is paralytic ileus it's a very common term which is used in surgical uh, in surgical units that this patient has paralytic ileus very commonly used term now by definition what is paralytic ileus now paralytic ileus is a state in which there is failure of transmission of peristaltic waves secondary to neuromuscular failure what's meant by that that the myenteric plexus two there are two plexus neuron plexus in the wall of the gut one is myenteric plexus also called orbex plexus which is present in the muscular layer and the second uh, plexus is some mucosal plexus which is also called mesner plexus so this is the paralysis of these nerve plexus in the wall of the gut which leads to basically temporary paralysis of the gut no transmission of peristalsis now the when there is paralysis no gut motility no movement in the gut the resultant stasis leads to accumulation of large amount of fluid as well as gas within the ball with associated distension so when there is accumulation large amount of fluid and gas within the ball this will be associated with cross distension of the abdomen patient may be having vomiting we auscultate this abdomen there is absence of bowel sounds and patient present with absolute constipation in these cases of paralytic ileus that means no passage of stool but very important no passage of flatus as well now what are the different varieties of paralytic ileus i always say when you say paralytic ileus keep in mind it is always secondary so there is some underlying cause paralytic ileus is always secondary so here we can discuss what are the different types of varieties of paralytic ileus one is post operative a degree of ileus usually occurs after any abdominal procedure and it is usually self limiting it is very common that uh, an any op procedure where we open the abdomen poor patient goes into uh, ileus for some time that again depends upon the gravity of the uh, abdominal operation and this is variable ranging from 24 hour to 72 hours this post operative paralytic ileus usually it is self limiting and it resolves within 24 hour to 72 hours depending upon what type of procedure has been done on the abdomen sometimes it is prolonged in the presence of hyperuricemia hypoproteinemia or other metabolic abnormalities so is this thing must be kept in mind but delayed prolonged post post operative paralytic ileus is worrisome you have we have to see what is any other comorbidity which can lead to this so one variety is post operative paralytic ileus second as i told you is always secondary paralytic ileus is always secondary so another variety other cause may be infections intra abdominal sepsis may give rise to localized or generalized ileus 
So presence of eye of sepsis within the peritoneal cavity leads to paralytic ileus, whether it is localized or it is generalized. Then another variety of paralytic ileus is reflex ileus. This may occur following fractures of the spine or ribs. We have seen many times patient with trauma, bony fractures, fracture of the spine, fracture of the ribs. And when we see abdominal, there is paralytic ileus, gut is not working, moving for some time after this. Retroperitoneal hemorrhage or even the application of a plaster jacket, sometimes which we apply plaster jacket or spine. So this can also lead to reflex ileus uh, of the intestine. The fourth variety of paralytic ileus, we sometimes say it's the metabolic, metabolic causes, secondary paralytic ileus due to metabolic causes, uremia, hypokalemia are the most common contributory factors in this type of paralytic ileus. Now clinical feature of paralytic ileus, paralytic ileus takes on a clinical significance if it persists beyond 72 hours. Usually, I, as I told you, it resolves within 24 hours to 72 hours. But if it is prolonged beyond 72 hours, then you have to be, then we have to see, we, this is something which is, uh, is of clinical significance. There has been no return of bowel sounds on auscultation. That means if it is delayed, paralytic ileus is delayed. Obviously, when we auscultate the abdomen, bowel sounds, they are not audible. There has been no passage of flatus. So, if it is delayed, obviously after laparotomy in many cases, so there will be no bowel sound and patient says he is not passing any flatus. Abdominal distension becomes more marked and abdomen is tympanetic. I am talking about the paralytic ileus when it is delayed after 72 hours. So abdomen will be, distension becomes marked and we, if we percuss this abdomen, abdomen will be tympanetic more of a gaseous distension as compared to fluid within the large gut. Colicky pain, which is a very important feature of acute intestinal obstruction. It is not a feature of, is feature of paralytic ileus. It is not a feature of paralytic ileus. Paralytic ileus, distension increases pain from the abdominal wound. So pain, in, so it's not the colicky pain which is important parallel ileus. There is no colicky pain. But due to distension, what happens when the abdomen is grossly distended, the, as the patient is post-operative, the abdominal wound, there will be more tension of the abdominal wound and it becomes more painful. So only the distension increases the pain from the abdominal wound. Effortless, as I told you, vomiting is not a very marked feature, but with paralytic ileus, it becomes sometimes still an important feature. And in paralytic ileus, effortless vomiting may occur in these patients. So, investigation is usually not required in post operative paralytic ileus, but when it extend beyond 72 hours then then we have to see what why why it is prolonged then few investigation may be required abdominal x-ray one investigation will show gas filled loops of intestine with multiple fluid levels so multiple air and fluid levels on plain x-ray abdomen this is this is a picture of paralytic ileus CT scan abdomen, another investigation when palatic ileus after laparotomy is prolonged is the most in fact effective investigation and will demonstrate any intra-abdominal sepsis or 
any mechanical obstruction, maybe a band, a fibrinous tense, fibrinous adhesion sometimes. CT scan can exclude any mechanical cause if it is there postoperatively or it can show you whether any residual collection or intra-abdominal sepsis is present or not. So CT scan, another important investigation if the paralytic ileus is delayed after laparotomy. Specific treatment, no management of, if you talk about the management of paralytic ileus, specific treatment is obviously directed towards what is the cause of the paralytic ileus. We have seen so many causes, we are talking about the so many causes which can lead to paralytic ileus. So our specific treatment will be directed towards the underlying cause of the paralytic ileus. Nasogastric tubes are not required routinely after elective intra-abdominal surgery. Paralytic ileus is managed with the use of nasogastric suction and restriction of oral intake until bowel sounds and the passage of flatus returns. Electrolyte balance must be maintained. The, and this is monitored with daily serum electrolytes. The use, uh, the use of an enhanced recovery program with early introduction of fluids and solids is becoming increasingly popular nowadays. So specific treatment which is directed towards the underlying cause but the following general principles must be kept in mind. What are these general principles? If a primary cause is identified, this must be treated. Number two, gastrointestinal distension must be relieved by nasogastric decompression, decompression and restriction of oral intake. Then we should give close attention to the fluid and electrolyte imbalance monitored with, with daily investigation like serum electrolytes and, and, and the volume. Use of peristaltic stimulants. Rarely in resistant cases we use gastroprokinetic agents such as domperidone or erythromycin because they increase intestinal motility may be used provided they that an intraperitoneal cause has been excluded. So intraperitoneal cause, after removing that, then we can think about these agents which increase intestinal motility. If the paralytic ileus is prolonged, CT scanning is the most effective investigation. It will demonstrate any intra-abdominal sepsis or mechanical obstruction and therefore guide may guide any requirement of laparotomy for paralytic ileus. Otherwise, the decision to take a patient back to the theater in these circumstances is always difficult. The need of a laparotomy becoming increasingly likely the longer the bowel intract inactivity persists, particularly if it lasts for more than seven days or if the bowel activity recommences following surgery and then stops again. And it's a point to note that if the bowel activity recommences following surgery and then again stops, this is significant and this should be kept in mind. Now talking about the pseudo obstruction. What is pseudo obstruction? An obstruction usually of the colon, maybe it's a small intestine also, that occurs in the absence of a mechanical cause or acute intra-abdominal disease. So what is pseudo obstruction? When there is no mechanical cause detectable and there is no acute intra-abdominal disease. 
after excluding these then we can say that this is a case of pseudo obstruction pseudo obstruction can affect small bowel also but usually it is the large bowel which with pseudo obstruction Now there are a number of factors we can enumerate them which are associated with pseudo obstruction. Among these are metabolic causes, severe trauma, aftershock, secondary gastrointestinal involvement. So among the metabolic factors, patients have diabetes, patients with hypokalemia, uremia, mixed edema, and patients have intermittent porphyria. These are factors associated with pseudo obstruction. Severe trauma, especially to the lumbar spine or pelvis, this also results in pseudo obstruction. Patients of shock, like patient shock in burns, myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, patients of stroke, then septicemia, post operative. These are all post-operative patients with shock. They are also factors which can lead to pseudo obstruction. Secondary gastrointestinal involvement, then with scleroderma and Chagas disease, can so can also result in pseudo obstruction. These are the factors which associated with uh, with pseudo obstruction. Similarly, retroperitoneal irritation and how this occurs. This irritation can occur with blood, extravasation of urine in the retroperitoneum, enzyme pancreatitis leading to retroperitoneal because pancreas is a retroperitoneal structure, tumors in the retroperitoneum, they can be associated with pseudo obstruction. Then number of drugs like tricyclic antidepressants, phenothiazines, laxative, they are associated with pseudo obstruction so these are factors that can see in cases of pseudo obstruction whether these are present or not small intestinal pseudo obstruction because small intestinal not commonly involved with pseudo obstruction it is the large gut but it can be involved with small intestinal pseudo obstruction it is usually Primary pseudo obstruction of the small bowel is usually idiopathic or it may be associated with familial visceral myopathy. Secondary type of small bowel intestinal pseudo obstruction is associated with neuroleptic medications, opiates, severe metabolic illnesses, mixed edema, diabetes mellitus. So, these these lead to secondary pseudo obstruction of the small bowel. Clinical feature in these patients usually consist of recurrent attacks of subacute intestinal obstruction of the small bowel. Diagnosis is usually by the exclusion of a mechanical cause. So the, if the, you don't find any mechanical cause and there is a small gut obstruction, we can think about small intestinal pseudo obstruction now how will you treat these cases of pseudo obstruction in the small bone obviously initial correlation of any underlying disorders if any disorder is associated factor is associated with the pseudo obstruction that must be addressed and correlated and then addressed for treatment metoclopramide metoclopramide in the form of maxilone and similarly erythromycin a macrolide antibiotic which increases the intestinal motility may be used in these patients of small bowel super obstruction now if we talk about the clonic pseudo obstruction pseudo obstruction in large bowel it may be of two variety one is acute which is also called a Gilvey syndrome and it also has a chronic form. So acute clonic pseudo obstruction and chronic clonic pseudo obstruction. 
These are two varieties when we say pseudo obstruction of the large bowel. Now, Ogilvy syndrome, which is acute pseudo colonic pseudo obstruction, also called as I said, is also called Ogilvy syndrome. This is after Sir Ogilvy in 1948, who described the condition of distension of the colon with signs and symptoms of clonic obstruction in the absence of an actual physical cause of the obstruction. No detection of any cause, mechanical cause of uh, uh, he described in his uh, description. So that's why we call it a Gilvey syndrome, acute colonic pseudo obstruction case. It usually occurs in critically ill patients. Ogilvy syndrome occurs in critically ill patients, commonly seen in right and ascending colon and the transverse colon. These are the usual sites where Ogilvy syndrome can occur. Now, pathogenesis, what happens? How this develops? This is due to sacral parasympathetic nerve dysfunction sacral out parasympathetic outflow from the sacral nerves atonia of the descending colon causing functional obstruction splenic flexion is the junction of dilated and collapsed parts of the colon because this is the site where parasympathetic, parasympathetic supply of the vagus ends and the parasympathetic supply of the sacral out parasympathetic outflow starts that's why this is the area where distended colon ends and the collapse is distal to the splenic flexion. Increased sympathetic activity leads to what? Uh, when there is a parasympathetic failure, paralysis, dysfunction, this leads to increased sympathetic activity which leads to colonic dilatation. So colonic dilatation in this patient is due to increased sympathetic activity. What are the clinical features of this large yet pseudo obstruction? On examination, if we say abdomen is usually tympanetic and it is non tender, abdomen is grossly distended, and sometimes normal bowel sound may be audible. So, if we talk about the clinical feature in these patients, abdomen is grossly distended. Even you can see it is on inspection, on pale patient, although it is distended but it is non-tender. When we percuss this abdomen, it is tympanetic. And when we auscultate, some um, normal bowel sound may be present. Associated with this, there may be features of Causative etiology. What is the causative etiology? What is the causative ca underlying cause that may show its own symptomatology? Abdominal examination, special attention to tenderness and peritonism over the cecum. So this is very important. Keep in mind when these patients come and we are managing this patient and one of the part of the management is obviously the treatment is a conservator and we monitor the abdomen so in these patients it must be kept in mind because are there any features of tenderness are there any features of peritonism especially over its right side the site of cecum because this is the area of the large gut which is blind and it bears the maximum brunt of intracolonic pressure. So here ischemia and even ischemic patches can develop which lead to features of peritonism. Cecal perforation is more likely if the cecal diameter is 14 cm or greater. This you can see on plain x-ray. So if the cecum is grossly distended and the diameter becomes uh, it's the same 14 centimeter or greater which we can measure on a plain x-ray the chances of fecal per perforation are 
great. Now, in this patient, what investigation they are required as very important investigation, inflammatory investigation is these advise abdominal x-ray, plain x-ray abdomen evidence of colonic obstruction will be there with marked cecal distension being a this is a common feature on plain x-ray abdomen. Colonoscopy, the role of colonoscopy as an investigation for diagnosis and then it can also be used for therapeutic that is colonoscopic decompression. This is another place for colonoscopy in these patients. Single contrast water soluble water soluble anema barium anema is another investigation which will help in these patient of pseudo obstruction contrast enhanced ct scan has a place to rule out mechanical obstruction in this patient so these are the investigation which are required in this patient now treatment of this these patients that is colonic cases of colonic pseudo obstruction what is the treatment how we will treat this patient we have to give this patient uh, initial which is supportive treatment usually these patients they are treated conservatively and what is conservative treatment in these patient or what is supportive treatment in this patient nasogastric tube placement that to decompress the gut which especially if the stomach is also distended. We have to give IV fluids in these patients. Also, we have to replace electrolytes. These patients are depleted chronically and they, that leads to electrolyte uh, imbalance also, hyponatremia, hypokalemia in these patients. We pass a Foley's catheter in these patients. Why? To monitor, to monitor the to monitor the urine output regarding your resuscitation, monitoring of the resuscitation. We also measure abdominal girth that also helps, helps us while treating conservatively. If there is an identifiable cause, if there is any identifiable cause, treat that identifiable cause if it is there. No. Cases of colonic pseudo obstruction, we have a medical treatment also. What is medical treatment in these patients? Motility enhancing drugs like neostigmine and erythromycin, these are used in these patients. Once confirmed that pseudo Obstruction requires treatment of any identifiable cause. It should be done. If this is ineffective, intravenous neostigmine should be given. One milligram intravenous intravenously given. With a further one milligram given intravenously within a few minutes if the first dose is ineffective. During this procedure, while we are giving intravenous neostigmine, it is best to sit with the patient on a so electro ECG is monitoring is done in this patient that is required and atropine should be available when we are treating with these drugs so IV new stigma has a place which enhances the motility and, and increases similarly erythromycin what is erythromycin it's a macrolide antibiotic and it increases the intestinal motility. So, during this intravenous uh, neostigmine parasympathomimetic drug ECG monitoring as well should be done and atropine should be available if there is a bradycardia to treat this with atropine. Other aspect of uh, treatment 
that includes clonic clonoscopic decompression as i told you while investigation with a clonoscope it is diagnostic as well as as a therapeutic part also so clonoscopic decompression in cases of clonic pseudo obstruction this is has a place surgery why what is what is the indication of surgery in this patient indica surgery is indicated when there is impending perforation or peritonitis and in large gut of pseudo obstruction it is the cecum which has a chance of because grossly distended is has cecum there are patches of ischemia ischemic patches develop on this and that can lead to perforation and peritonitis so this is one indication where surgery is done another procedure which sometimes can be done in these patients is endoscopic tube colostomy this is a procedure which acts this endoscopic placement of tube as a colostomy acts as a vent for patients with those with a chronic unremitting condition chronic unremitting condition it is one place where you can put this endoscopic tube colostomy so this was all about the chronic intestinal obstruction then paralytic ileus and then pseudo obstruction on the small and large gut now if you have any question you can ask me on and you can put those questions in your uh, whatsapp group i will i can be helpful in that group thank you